Well, good morning, church family. It's, uh, it's great to be uh, here. Um, it's great to have you join us through our live stream this morning uh, from wherever you are. Uh, we're thankful that you've, you've chosen to join us. Uh, my name is Jason Hyde. I'm one of the pastors here at SEMC. Um, we'd like to extend our condolences to uh, Mary Coop and to Garth Coop on the passing of Blair. Uh, that was Mary's grandson and Garth's nephew. Uh, he was killed in a single vehicle uh, accident on Thursday. We'd also like to extend our condolences to Valida Friesen on the passing of her husband Vic. Uh, Vic passed away on Monday. Uh, as some of you may have noticed, uh, I have been uh, gone the last couple of weeks. Um, to put it more accurately, I guess I've been in my basement for the last couple of weeks, uh, dealing with the effect of this uh, COVID virus. And uh, if, to be honest, it was a pretty rough time. Um, the first week was was relatively okay. I dealt with uh, like moderate flu-like symptoms. Uh, that the second week was was a lot worse. Uh, then I had uh, dizziness going on and uh, nauseous nauseousness. I was tired, uh, and this led me to actually feel quite discouraged that week. Um, and then to add to that, there's this isolation that I experienced being quarantined from my family and from everyone else in my basement. Um, and it was, a, it was a challenging couple of weeks. And I don't share this to get political or, or anything like that. Uh, in fact, I intentionally did not share this uh, for a, a while because uh, there seemed to be this stigma around people that got the virus. And, um, but I realized that... We need to share our struggles with, with people in our lives because God has designed us to need one another. And so I share this specifically because uh, we have quite a few from our community. Uh, more specifically, we have people from our congregation who are struggling with these very same things. And so I'd like to encourage you to look for ways to encourage uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to pray for them, uh, to send messages, to encourage them. Um, I'm very thankful for all of those, all of you who reached out to me uh, to encourage me in that time. Uh, so if you are isolating at home for whatever reason, if you have the virus or if you're staying at home to uh, protect yourself or, or whatever the reason is, uh, we would like to offer to help you. And so if you need groceries or if you need medications delivered, uh, we would be delighted to help you in whatever way we can. Uh, likewise, if you would like to be a delivery person or to help in that way, uh, also please let us know. Um, and so we'd love to be able to support our church family in, in these ways. Uh, as we continue our worship this morning, I'd like to read from uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. Good morning, church. Second Timothy 1.7 says this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I chose these songs a few weeks ago, believing and feeling that we needed some encouragement. And I hope that this does encourage you and that you would sing them in your home and raise your voice with me now as I get all my chord charts up here. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope. Strong deliverer, you are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender. 
comfort those in need you lift us up on wings like eagles strength to rise as we wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord strength to rise as we wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord our God you reign forever our hope our strong Fine, no 
As we uh, move into this uh, time where we would typically take the offering, I would just like to express again our thanks to you for your faithful giving uh, in this time. Uh, giving is one of the ways that we express our, our faith, our thankfulness, our trust to God. Uh, some of the ways that you can give are, uh, are on our web- website. You can give through uh, e-transfer, through PayPal, through credit card, or you can stop by the church to drop it off. Uh, as we move into our prayer time this morning, um, I'd like to take some time to pray for uh, those in our congregation who are, are struggling with, with health issues, particularly those who are dealing with uh, COVID-related illnesses. Um, so I just invite us to take a few moments to pray silently for these people. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your presence in our lives. Uh, You are our hope, our strength, our sustainer in hard times. Uh, You are the giver of all that is good. Uh, You are a rock when the world seems uh, crazy and uncertain. And this morning, Lord, we bring before you those who are struggling with these health issues, uh, specifically those dealing with with COVID and, and, and isolation. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, strengthen and encourage them. And Lord, we ask that you would prompt others to extend encouragement to them. And Father, we also pray for our government, for those making decisions and policies. And we recognize the tough uh, position that they are in. And we pray that you would grant them your wisdom and your guidance uh, as they lead. Uh, We pray for those in the medical field and ask that you would protect them and fill them with hope and with peace in the midst of everything they're experiencing. Lord, may all of us know that you are Lord. Uh, You are Lord uh, over all things. And we trust you and we put our hope and our future in you. And God, as we remember all that you have given us, Lord, we pray that you would help us uh, to continue being faithful and generous uh, to follow your example. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless the gifts given and the tithes given and use them for your glory. I pray, God, that you would purify us and cleanse our hearts and equip us for your service as we reach out to people in need and those around us. Grow in us soft hearts and help us to love and to serve those around us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I was thinking over the service this morning, that Second Timothy 1.7 came to mind. For he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and self-control. And I was realizing over the weekend as well that I had been um, acknowledging and grieving in ways the things that I've chosen to give up and that we have had to give up during this time. And for some of the, for some of you, it's real loss. It's family members and it's um, 
relationships and its jobs. And I was just thinking that it's important to say those things out loud, face those, and acknowledge the things that we've given up on purpose and had to give up. And um, that was kind of a healthy process. And I pray that we don't get bitter in that process, but that we would just be able to say those things out loud now. This song, um, it's called Get Your Hopes Up, and I, I think it, I'll just let it speak for itself. I see the sun waking up in the morning, reviving dreams. I feel the wind on my back with promise, reminding me that there's a garment of praise for heaviness. There's a new song burning inside my chest. I'm living in the goodness that he brings. So get your hopes up, lift your head up, let your faith arise. Get your hopes up, our God is for us, he's brought us back to life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brandon. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we gather in your name this morning, Jesus, in all the different places that we are right now. And Lord, we just pray that um, as we open up Scripture, that you illuminate the truths that you have for us. We pray, Lord, uh, that we will be receptive to your Holy Spirit working and moving in our lives. We love you. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I think a lot of young people, when they're from young on, uh, look forward to the day when they can drive, uh, drive a vehicle. Um, and uh, I have uh, this 
privilege, uh, if you could call it that, in my office, if I look out of my window, um, I see um, the driving schools uh, teaching students how to parallel park. And that is pretty much the sort of the, the epitome or the climax of learning how to drive is this challenge of learning how to parallel park. And they set up the poles and I can just kind of hear the instructions and, and students are trying to get that car angled kind of correctly and measuring and all of that and trying to figure this out. And if you remember uh, when you first learned to drive, somehow we go from never having ridden a vehicle before to getting behind the wheel. And uh, there's that time when you're told you're going to use your right foot for the accelerator, the gas pedal, but you're also going to use it for the brake. And that alone is kind of mind-boggling. You're like, what? i got to use one for both? And then you're looking over your shoulder, and you're trying to figure that out. And all of these different things and technical things that we're supposed to keep in our mind and figure out. And somehow we manage over time to learn how to parallel park, learn how to drive, learn how to use one foot for the gas and the brake, and eventually it even becomes uh, instinctive. And so what we're doing, what is actually happening is uh, things are moving from uh, explicit memory, that is, uh, we have to consciously recall how to do that, and eventually it moves to implicit memory where we aren't consciously recalling, we're just instinctively, naturally able to do these different uh, parts of driving a vehicle. So it moves from explicit to implicit memory. We learn, we're given instruction, eventually it becomes more habitual through practice, it becomes a habit, and then it moves from that to an instinct or an impulse. Now, instincts or impulses show up in times naturally, like when we're riding a, a, a bicycle or driving a car, but instincts or impulses also, also show up in times of urgency or crisis. And you could say uh, the circumstances that we're in right now lend themselves to a lot of instinct or impulsive behavior. We've temporarily suspended our original sermon series in order to bring this three-part mini-series entitled Emotional Rescue. And the reason is that uh, emotions are especially heightened at this time. Uh, when we talk about emotions, I'm referring to uh, an equation that uh, Dr. Charles Stone has um, presented in his book, Holy Noticing, um, and that is that emotions are thoughts plus feelings plus a uh, behavioral impulse and a bodily sensation. And so in our sermon series, we were investigating these aspects. And first of all, what we were learning about was uh, God's emotional state, if you will. The idea is that we want to actually learn about God's emotional state so that we understand how he relates to us and his character, but then also what he models for us in our daily life. And so we looked first of all at God's thoughts, the mind of Christ, and we learned that it is primarily God is focused, Jesus Christ modeled that he was focused on God's will and that it became focused, that will was to consider others. God's feelings, the divine feeling, his uh, feeling towards us, the primary one is that of compassion. And so we learn that God's will and his thoughts and his feelings are towards us in that way. And so this morning we want to consider what is God's divine instinct, if you will, or his impulse, his action towards us, the divine action towards us. And we want to understand this so we can understand God's character, but also because we are disciples or followers, students of the Lord, and he will demonstrate this to us so that we can also model it in our lives. What we have learned is that our memory and our instincts de are, uh, develop as a process. 
This Dr. Eric Kandel is a medical doctor. He is also a neuroscientist. And he's a Nobel Prize winner for his work in physiological basis of memory storage in neurons. And what Dr. Kendall tells us is that our memory develops in stages. And for our memory to be long-term and have effect, it is deeply and thoroughly processed. And here's another interesting thing that Dr. Kendall tells us, is that there is a gene that acts like a switch, allowing memory to move to long-term memory. So allowing things to move from explicit to implicit. And what's interesting about this gene is that it is influenced by environment. In other words, it can be influenced by learning. This is what Dr. Mark Lewis, another developmental neuroscientist, refers to when he talks about neuroplasticity. So there are, there's a biological makeup, of course, to our being, but it is, uh, we can learn and we can adjust even our mind and our brain. So then we come to an occasion like this, in this COVID, uh, you could say pandemic, this crisis that we're in, and it triggers certain emotions for us. Uh, we are uh, triggered, perhaps someone gets sick, perhaps someone gets a call, whatever the circumstance is, and we are, our emotions are triggered. Maybe it's thoughts, and you have a lot of thoughts, what if this, what if that, and these thoughts begin to uh, uh, rumble and percolate. Maybe it's triggered and you have certain feelings, anxiety, fear, anger, frustration, And out of those triggers, what happens, there's another aspect to our neurological makeup, which is called the vagus nervous system. And it is activated, and the sympathetic nervous system is kind of like the highway that takes us to the place called fight or flight. So the sympathetic nervous system takes us down to the road called fight or flight, and that's what happens when we are triggered in our emotions. And we begin to try and repress or, or bang those emotions down like whack-a-mole we talked about last week. Or we strike out, we lash out, or we curl up. And what is interesting to me is that when I say we, I'm also referring to those of us that are followers of Jesus. Jesus. So how could it be that people of faith, and we have this biological makeup that is there, but that we can get to a place where we allow this fight or flight mechanism that we have to cause us to lash out or to curl up when we are followers of Jesus? Uh, Jesus' brother James wrote a bit about this In the book of James, and I invite you to turn in your Bibles to James, it's near the end of the New Testament. Uh, In fact, uh, you'll find it Hebrews, James. So Revelation, if you make your way back from Revelation, you'll find the book of James. And I want to read a couple of verses, first of all, from chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. If any of you is lacking wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So here is James talking about this aspect of being double-minded. And he says it's like being like a wave that is controlled and affected and, and comes and goes. Essentially, a wave is something that is the result of wind. It has no control of its own. And so the circumstances of life just continue to move this wave back and forth. And James is saying this is how we live when we allow uh, these biological aspects and the circumstances of life to dictate how we actually live our lives. 
is double-mindedness. And this is a penchant of human beings and has been part of our history from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve is described in the creation story in Genesis. They were with God. And yet when it came time and they were, Adam and Eve were tempted, they became double-minded. They, became, they started to have doubts. Was that really what God said? Is God really this? Is God really that? And it didn't take long before they were influenced by other factors and were drawn away. This double-mindedness we see even in the history of our uh, uh, ancestry back in the uh, Israelites. God had rescued them from Egypt, part of the salvation story of rescuing them out of Egypt and bringing them to what he was calling the promised land. And yet when they began to experience some hardship, it didn't take long for them to get to the very point of even melting gold and creating an idol. And they were again just so susceptible to the external influences that they were living this double-mindedness. Jesus describes this condition, this double-minded condition, this dilemma that we are in. Jesus describes this in a parable when he talks about uh, the sower and the seeds. And he talks about the, the seed being the word of God and how it is scattered in different places. It is scattered liberally. But he says how some of it lands in, in a rocky place. And he says that is uh, in a rocky place. And so it, it lands there. But when it is tested, um, it is, uh, th those people fall away because they don't have roots. It falls away because, in essence, they haven't developed this long-term memory, if you will. Then he goes on to say that as some is scattered among thorns and he describes that as it is, it is scattered there and people hear. But then the thorns he, he likens to um, the cares, the concerns of the world or the lure and desires of the world. In which we can certainly relate to now the cares and concerns of the world or the desires of the world. And so people are drawn and fall away from that. And so again, we are caught up in this double mindedness. And how do we combat that? What is God's divine impulse and his divine instinct? What does God do? And. What is Jesus' model for us that we might follow so that we can learn as disciples of Jesus Christ? I want to continue with uh, Jesus' brother James in the book of James. And I want to take us now to uh, chapter 4 in James. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 8. Those Conflicts and disputes among you. Where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? And I just want to pause here. Um, so much of this could be applicable uh, to even the social media and the rhetoric and everything that's going on here. So I invite you to just really listen, open up to the, uh, the, the words and, and let the Holy Spirit speak to us clearly through this. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it. So you commit murder. You covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? He is yearning for your spirit. 
but he gives all the more grace. (laughs) Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God. Draw near. Engedzo. Engage. This is the divine impulse to draw near, to engage. This is what God does. In the garden, when Adam and Eve had wandered and were double-minded, we read that God comes looking for them. He draws near. In the case of the Israelites, God continually draws near and draws near and draws near. Jesus, the incarnate Word of God, is God drawing near. He is engaging. It is people that fail. And so it is the divine impulse. God's action towards us is to draw near. It is people that fail to draw near to Him. That is, until Jesus arrives. And what Jesus does is He perfectly draws near to the Lord. Being fully man, He draws near to the Lord. And we see that already as he begins his public ministry at his baptism. And he is drawn into the desert. And he is there, coincidentally, for 40 days. And it seems that he is beginning to unravel the 40 years of of double-mindedness. And he is in the desert And he is there for 40 days. And then Satan tempts him. And now we hear already reaching back all the way to the Genesis account where Satan again tempts the original humans. But what Jesus does in the desert at that time is he draws near to the Lord. Each time the devil tempts him with this, that, or the other circumstance, Jesus draws near to the Lord by reciting scripture. He doesn't um, uh, lean on his uh, own strength. He doesn't lean on a lot of uh, human wisdom or rationale, but he draws near to the Lord by drawing on Scripture that he has memorized. And this aspect of drawing near becomes the pattern of Jesus' life as we understand, as as Luke records it in the Gospel of Luke. In each case, we understand what Jesus is doing is he continually draws near to the Lord. At the time of baptism, we hear that Jesus had, was drawing near to the Lord. He was praying. Before he goes to choose his 12 disciples, he goes and draws near to the Lord. At the time prior to his betrayal, when he is going to be led away to his eventual death, he draws near to the Lord. John records when his, uh, John the Baptist is uh, uh, captured and eventually killed, Jesus draws, uh, goes to draw away to be near the Lord. This is the pattern. Jesus drawing near the Lord. And Jesus overcomes. He overcomes each circumstance, whether it is a cosmic battle, uh, spiritual warfare, w- whatever the circumstance, whether it is uh, imminent physical material attack, He draws near to the Lord, and in each case, with that, he is able to overcome and succeed the circumstance that he is in. And so then he instructs his disciples, those that are with him, he instructs them to follow in his step of also drawing near. In fact, it gets to a point where the disciples say, Jesus, we see you drawing near so often. Can you teach us to draw near? And he instructs the disciples on how to draw near to God. And he's inviting us. He's inviting us to join him in this pattern of drawing near to the Lord. To join Jesus who is the one who has overcome. The one who is our guarantee that we too can overcome if we join him and draw near to him. The challenge we have is being Double-minded. 
purify your hearts. The word heart, the Greek word is cardia, cardia, and whenever it is used in the New Testament, it always refers to the inner life. It never refers to the actual muscle, the, the organ of the heart. Cardia refers to the inner life. Purify your inner life, and this word double-minded, um, uh, dip, dis, dipsychos, <laughs> And it comes from two words, dis, which means two, and suche, which is soul or mind, is being of two minds. Purify your inner self of being of these two minds. In other words, be single-minded. And draw near to the Lord. Engage the Lord as first priority. And friends, that is really the message that, that, that I have for us this morning is draw near to the Lord. And listen, this is not therapeutic in the sense of God is my therapist. When we draw near to the Lord as our first priority, we are proclaiming that he is king, that he is alive, and that he is Lord of our life. And here's a dilemma for followers of Jesus. We can hesitate. Because the wager is significant. And by drawing near to the Lord, the wager, we hesitate because we might doubt that if we draw near to the Lord, we doubt that God is actually alive or that God will actually act or that God will actually care. We doubt that anything good could actually come of that. Or maybe we have fear, we fear that nothing will happen. Or we fear that when we draw near to the Lord, He will act or do in a, uh, something in a way that is uh, against what we desire. And so when, when James says, uh, you know, cleanse our hands as sinners. We actually need to draw near to the Lord, but we need to confess and acknowledge our doubts and our fears and our skepticism. We need to confess that. It does no good to have these uh, postures and uh, to hold on to them. We may as well confess that we have doubts, that we have fears, that we are concerned, and bring all of that to the Lord. And essentially, repent and draw near to the Lord. Let go of all of that and actually be willing to have the mind of Christ to say God's will. So when we draw near, when we are single-minded and we draw near, we are expressing our faith in the living Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, all of us are placing our faith in something or someone. And this COVID circumstance that we are in should at least tell us and we should acknowledge and realize that most of life is fleeting, faulty, or fickle. If we place our, uh, our ultimate hope and trust, if we place our faith in the circumstance of life, if we place it in our position, in our job, in our finances, in our health, in our education, in another person, we will finally, ultimately find ourselves in a place of disappointment. So when we come near, and we could try harder, you could try and with all kinds of efforts, but you will find as much as you try that it doesn't get you to the place where you need to be, which is... To draw near to the Lord with the conviction that He is our salvation. With the conviction that He will help. Surely He will help. Surely He will strengthen. Surely He will rescue, heal, and deliver. That He will find a way. An openness to the Lord that he will make a way where there seems to be no way. Isn't that really what Scripture is revealing to us? Whether it is the Israelites facing the Red Sea with an Egyptian army coming down on them, and it seemed like there was no way. When Abraham was told that he would have a son, and it seemed like there was no way. When Jesus was on the cross and he was being killed and it seemed like there was no way. God makes a way where there seems for us to be no way. And so salvation is grander. 
It is a larger scope than we have sometimes understood it to be. Salvation is, yes, salvation is that you were saved. I am saved. That is, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I receive the Holy Spirit, and I am saved. But we are also being saved. We are being saved, we are being rescued, we are being uh, sanctified, we are being helped in the present. And ultimately, one day in the future, when Christ returns, we will be saved. Justified, sanctified, and glorified. And so when we draw near to the Lord in the present, we are invoking this aspect of salvation. Emotional rescue. When you gather together with your friends or your family, when we have been gathering together in this sanctuary, when we gather together, we are drawing near to the Lord. We are being saved. This is rhythm of life, of drawing near to the Lord, uh, reminds me a lot of jazz music. <laughs> the last few days, um, I was listening to uh, some jazz music. Uh, I, I have been uh, having to work out using uh, an elliptical uh, that we got on Virage Sale a couple of years ago. Uh, right now, uh, I prefer to run outside, uh, but uh, an injury has uh, precluded my ability to do that and so I've been on an elliptical and so I've been listening either to podcasts or to music so I've been listening to this jazz music and uh, there's one tune was being played and I was I could recognize the song even though the melody wasn't what was being played but I could recognize the song because the musicians were playing enough of the melody and the melody was coming in and out enough that I could recognize the song. So the melody was always there even though the music was weaving in and around and, and out of it. And the reason I mention that is that this aspect of drawing near to the Lord is the melody that Jesus demonstrates for us. This is the melody, the rhythm of our life. Draw near to the Lord. Draw near to the Lord. And as life happens and circumstances happen throughout all of that, the Lord Jesus Christ continues to invite. He continues to say, Come unto me. Come unto me. Come to me. You who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. Jesus is inviting right now. He's inviting you to draw near. He's inviting you and maybe you've resisted. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about this. He's inviting you to draw near. Maybe you've been hurt by the church, the way that it has treated you, the way uh, Christians have treated you. But Jesus is inviting you and he says, come near. You're a healthcare professional and you're overwhelmed. There are times when you sit and cry. There are times in the morning when you're having breakfast and you're wondering, how are you going to go back to work? And he's inviting you. You may be a cook working right now. You may be a shopkeeper. Maybe you have COVID. Maybe you've tested positive. Maybe you're caring for somebody. Jesus is saying, come to me. Maybe you're angry and you're frustrated. And you feel like there's almost a rage, a war within you. But Jesus is saying, come to me. Come to me. And the place he is inviting you, and I want you to just use your imaginations because I believe the place he is inviting us to is representative, represented by the table. He is saying, come to me, and the place is the still water. A table by still water. He's saying, come to me, come to my table. 
come to me, meet me at the table. Meet me here at the table, beside still water. You can come any time. You can come many times. Come to me, meet me here at the table beside still water. How will you engage with him? Well, what we know is at first we're going to need to be explicit in doing this. When we're triggered, we know that the sympathetic nervous system causes a fight or flight response. But there is another nervous system called asympathetic. And how we can engage with him is beginning by just breathing. A few deep breaths will change the direction from going to fight or flight town to going to calm and serenity. A few deep breaths. Find your place. Say, Jesus, as you breathe in, you are my rock. Spend time with him at the table beside still water. Talk with him. Listen to him. Identify those thoughts you have. Identify those feelings that you have. Let him release and take the ones that are of no use, that are causing war within you. Draw near to the Lord through music and memory. Memorize scripture passages and music, praise and worship music. Draw near to him at the table beside still water. Let this be your rhythm of life. Let this be the melody of life for you. And remember, over time as you learn and you make this a habit, it will become an instinct. Like driving in your car. Oh, so are you weary and troubled? Light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. Life more abundant and free. Oh, so. Turn your eyes 
Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I miss you, and I uh, look forward to the day we can be together here again. Uh, we invite you to stay up to date with the stuff that's going on. You can check out our website. Uh, you can check out uh, our Facebook page. And uh, we also invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you get notifications when we go live. Uh, this Tuesday at uh, 1210, you are invited to join Pastor Gary for an online prayer time. Uh, you will find that on Facebook Live. Uh, and next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent, and so we'll be, we'll be starting a new uh, sermon series then. Uh, for our benediction this morning, I'm going to read from Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. And may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.
Thank you.